Okay, so let's continue. So we've done source throttling. Now we're going to switch to the last interference control technique that is very fundamental. I think uh, in the end we need to combine all of these. But we're going to talk about application and thread scheduling. Basically, uh, the idea here is to pick threads that do not badly interfere with each other to be scheduled together on cores sharing the memory system. That's the idea. Basically, minimize the interference by picking threads that go nicely with each other. And there are many ways of doing, thinking about this. I'm not going to cover a lot of ideas here, but I'm going to give you one example uh, that tries to do a lot of things at the same time. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, this, this work where we, where we really looked at uh, minimizing the shared uh, overall memory interference in a multi-core system that's relatively scalable with an on-chip network, uh, there are several ideas. We want to cluster the threads to the memory controllers to reduce across-chip interference, isolate interference-sensitive or low-intensity applications in a separate cluster, similar again, mice versus elephant, schedule the threads to different cores such that they can minimize interference, uh, and place applications that benefit from memory bandwidth closer to the controller. These are three key ideas, and this is all handled with thread scheduling. It's called application core mapping policies in this case. So basically, very quickly, I'm not going to go into the details of the paper a lot, but basically one of the issues with on-chip uh, distributed systems like this is you have memory controllers at some places and you have a shared cache bank that you may access at some other place. So what happens over here is you have one application accessing a shared cache bank and it gets the data. But if you get a cache miss, you need to first go to the memory controller, wait for the memory, and then memory controller responds back to the cache and then cache responds back to the core. Right? So there's a lot of traffic that happens this way. And if you think of a light application that's accessing this memory controller, it may get interfered by this heavy application that's also accessing that memory controller. Right? I've shown you this earlier before. You get significant slowdowns depending on your network design, depending on your placement of the applications, depending on the intensity of the application. So basically, we wanted to uh, spatially schedule these applications to these different cores. Assume that these are all single-threaded applications. You have, uh, there, there are many questions over here. How do you map the applications to the cores? Uh, what are the challenges? How do you reduce the communication distance between the application and the cache, between the application and the memory controller? How do you reduce destructive interference between applications? And how do you prioritize applications to improve throughput? Uh, this paper tackles these issues. I'm not going to talk about that. But its approach looks like this, basically. Uh, the first thing is clustering. And this is pictorial view. Uh, clustering means you limit the reach of an application, uh, meaning that this application is partitioned uh, uh, in the, into this cluster. And it can, also use the, it can only use the caches in this cluster. It can only use the memory control in this cluster. That's going to reduce a lot of our load as opposed to all of the applications ha having ability to access everywhere. It's going to improve locality of access also over here. It's going to reduce interference. So that's one big uh, item over here. How, how do you mean by software? By software, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is all software over here. The next one is balancing. You want to balance the load somehow across those different clusters such that no one cluster is worse than other because there's, there's bandwidth and uh, basically there's cache bandwidth and memory bandwidth over here. So if you actually oversubscribe one of the clusters, that's not good. So ideally, you would like to do as much as possible to maximize your bandwidth utilization. But you also need to be careful. There are some light applications, the, uh, the yellow ones over here. Maybe you want to isolate them because they're early mice and you don't want them to be interfered by these heavy applications over here. So that's the isolation. You re it reduces interference. And finally, uh, radial mapping. Radial mapping means that applications that require memory bandwidth a lot should get mapped to uh, where, wherever they can receive memory bandwidth a lot. So that looks like this, basically. That improves the bandwidth utilization. So that's the idea, or a set of ideas that are developed in this paper to tackle many issues at the same time. So step one, clustering, I'll go through this relatively quickly. This is the baseline. An application may be accessing many different caches, many different memory controls across the entire chip. <laughs> Why do we do that? This is inefficient. Basically, the idea is to limit the reach of each application. Now, you can access here. Somebody else can access here, but you don't interfere with that somebody else. So it improves your locality over here because it's shorter distance. And somebody else's locality over here and reduces interference 
uh, between them. So this is one example. This is the, you can read the paper for more detail, but these, this is a lot of applications. And this is the intensity, overall aggregate intensity of all applications together. So this is a more intense, higher intensity uh, system over here. Basically, this is the performance improvement compared, of clustering compared to the baseline relatively randomized mapping. So you actually gain a lot of performance improvements just, by, just from clustering, whatever that value is. And if you actually use uh, the entire mechanism that I just described very, at a very high level, you gain even more. But a lot of the benefits actually come from clustering, as you can see over here. And if you actually do this, this pool mechanism, you reduce the network power significantly also because you reduce the amount that you traverse in the network. So if you look over here, uh, this is baseline. This is clustering. Clustering by itself reduces the network power a lot. But if you actually do the other things that I briefly talked about, you actually reduce network power even more. That's all I'm going to say about this. There's a lot more detail, clearly, on this one. But the application to core mapping actually buys a lot of benefit if you do it very carefully. You could do it in smaller scale also. We, we want to look at a larger scale system. But for example, you could also uh, try to, if you, if you have many, many applications to schedule from, you could uh, pick the applications that go nicely with each other, right? Low intensity applications together. But then there might be downsides. You may not be utilizing your bandwidth really well. Okay. Any <laughs> thoughts? Well, Can yeah. You, you post frames and then you, I mean, you post all the statistics and then you have to do like schedule with the cluster and everything. Uh, How do you know? So clustering is actually uh, very easy. It basically limits where the applications go. But what the application goes to, yeah, what the applications go to what cluster, yes, you need to collect the statistics. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like a frame. Exactly, yeah. Or somebody provides that information to you, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. But in this case, we actually provide, uh, yeah, uh, get that information over some training or l uh, profiling period. Yeah, profiling. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Training is the fancy word today for profile. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about another uh, thread scheduling mechanism. Basically, uh, interference-aware thread scheduling uh, and compute clusters, data centers. You have a lot of these scheduling issues, and data centers can be running virtual machines. And we've been looking at virtual machines for some time. So if you look at virtualized cluster, uh, what uh, the cluster scheduling mechanism does is it needs to try to, it, it, it basically figures out which virtual machines should be scheduled to which hosts, right? You have this problem. And there are distributed resource management policies that people have developed. Uh, usually they're based on operating system level metrics. They don't take into account this sort of microarchitectural interference that we've been talking about. Usually, for example, you look at CPU utilization, memory capacity demand, and you try to uh, stack virtual machines based on that. For example, this is well, how you can look at a virtual machine. There is some CPU demand, there is some memory capacity demand. And the different virtual machines look different based on those demands, right? This one, for example, requires a lot of memory capacity and a lot of CPU. This one requires little of each. This one requires some memory capacity and a lot of CPU. And you schedule them somehow to <laughs> basically pack these things this way. Now, is this a good scheduling mechanism? Maybe if you only care about this, but this doesn't take into account microarchitectural interference in the memory system or the caches. Basically, if you look at uh, within a host, uh, virtual machines compute for, uh, compete for shared cache capacity as well as shared memory bandwidth, which we've been discussing for a while. And the operating system level metrics cannot capture this. The answer to this is no, basically, <laughs> clearly. So if you look at operating system level metrics, these are two different virtual machines that we looked at. Uh, CPU utilization is very high on both. Memory capacity requirements is very similar. But they're very different in terms of their memory bandwidth demand, as you can see. Their cache hit ratios are very different. So if you actually schedule based on what you see over here, you might actually come up with a schedule that looks like this. But now you're actually choking the memory bandwidth in this host, whereas this host has ample amount of memory bandwidth that's not utilized because you've scheduled this application that requires only one megabytes per second from memory. That's the idea. So if you're not aware of this microarchitecture level demand, you may do the wrong choice. 
And the impact of performance is over here. This is conventional distributed resource management mechanism that does the scheduling this way. If you actually are aware of this, you might just swap this, right? Uh, and you get significant performance improvements, as you can see over there. Okay, so that's the key idea over here. So we want to take into account microarchitecture level shared resource interference when we're actually scheduling these virtual machines, shared cache capacity, shared memory bandwidth. And the key idea is to monitor and detect microarchitecture level interference and balance these microarchitecture level resource usage across the cluster to minimize interference while maximizing system performance. I'm not going to go into the details of exactly how it's done. We use a lot of performance counters. So this is a real system design. We use performance counters from real systems to do the scheduling. We're not adding anything new, if you will. Uh, so this is the global architecture of a resource manager. Uh, you basically profile what's happening in the architectural resources of the applications, and you detect interference. And based on that, you migrate the threads. And if you want to know more, you can take a look. <laughs> it turns out this basically buys you more performance. Similar things are actually now employed, for example, in VMware's distributed resource management engines. They're actually looking at this microarchitecture level interference. But I think there can be more uh, to be done uh, in this area, uh, especially with hardware support. Like if you, can, if you can have better hardware support, you can do about much better partitioning over here. Okay. Any thoughts, questions? I know I didn't go into the detail, but if you go into detail, we'll never get to the next topics. But this gives you an idea of the power of the scheduling, uh, 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 application level scheduling. Now, if you want to satisfy quality of service requirements between those virtual machines uh, in this picture, then you have to provide some sort of hardware fairness substrate like what we've discussed, right? Because they're sharing resources still over here. This is a pure performance improvement mechanism. Okay, so uh, interference aware threat scheduling, uh, it has advantages. Basically, it can eliminate or minimize interference by scheduling symbiotic applications together as opposed to just managing the interference. So in a sense, it has similarities uh, to source throttling also uh, because it can reduce the load on a particular node. It's less intrusive to hardware because there's less need to modify the hardware resources. Uh, but of course, it comes with an overhead if you made the wrong choice again, there's high overhead to migrate threads and data between cores and machines. Uh, and it doesn't work well if all threads are similar and they interfere with each other. Basically, you need to have a lot of heterogeneity between your different threads to be able to take advantage of these. They, they usually count on heterogeneity. Okay, so let me summarize. Basically, we've covered a lot of interference uh, control techniques. Uh, prioritization, data mapping, core, source throttling, and application thread scheduling. Best is actually to combine all somehow. How would you do that? I don't know the answer. <laughs> That's something that, uh, actually there are a lot of future work in each of these as well as combinations of these. But we've covered two different approaches, smart resources, DOM resources. Smart resource, we spent a lot of time on quality of service aware memory scheduling. We talked about source throttling and channel partitioning as examples of DOM resources, meaning keep the resources DOM. But both approaches are effective in reducing interference and there's no single best approach for all workloads. So you really need to combine them all. Techniques, uh, request thread scheduling, source solving, memory partitioning. Again, all approaches are effective in reducing interference. They can be applied at different levels, hardware and software. But there's no single best technique for all workloads. You really want to combine. And some combined approaches that we've examined with very little computation, they're more powerful. OK, so we've talked about quality of service on aware memory. As a result, you get an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. And providing quality of service awareness improves performance, predictability, fairness, and utilization of the memory system. And we've discussed many new techniques to minimize memory interference, some new techniques to provide predictable performance. But I think there is a lot more, as I said earlier. Many new research ideas are needed for integrated techniques and for closing the interaction with the software. So especially this closing the interaction with software part is not fully done yet. So these are some of the things that we didn't cover. Uh, I think there are some backup slides if you're really interested in looking into this. Uh, yeah, how do you handle prefetches, for example? We didn't talk about that, but those are important also. How do you handle prefetches in the memory scheduling? There are other requests, reads and writes in memory scheduling. We didn't really talk about any of those, but there is work in that. How do you co-design the DRAM and the controller such that they work together nicely with each other? If DRAM has an open page, can you actually make use of that? Uh, Actually, this, this should be DRAM and cache 
code design or something like that. DRAM controller code design doesn't make sense, right? It should be DRAM cache, last level cache uh, code design. So if you, if you have a row buffer that's open, for example, in DRAM, you might as well use that to clean some of the dirty lines in your cache. Uh, cache interference management, we didn't cover, but you can read a lot of papers on that. Uh, interconnect, write read scheduling. Uh, DRAM designs to reduce interference, maybe I'll cover that. Let me think about it. There's also interference issues in near memory or in memory processing that we didn't really touch upon. So if you have an in memory processor, how, uh, how do you handle interference? How do you handle access control to that, right? That's, that's important. Okay, what the future may bring, I think, uh, I think we need more. Uh, this is one example. I think it's good to look at the real implementations, like FPGA-based implementations. Our infrastructure is actually very flexible to, be, to enable that sort of prototype implementations at least. And uh, yeah, interference and quality of service in the presence of even more heterogeneity is in, very interesting also. Any questions? So this is the infrastructure basically there. I think there's a lot of quality of service that um, um, uh, research that this infrastructure can also enable. I don't know if I want to go into some other ideas over here. <laughs> Any questions? Thoughts? We need to do some time budgeting. I could spend 20 more minutes on some other ideas or we could move to interconnects or we could move to heterogeneous multi-core. All sounds good. <laughs> oh, I see. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. What about this? <laughs> You're tired of this? <laughs> if I give you a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> this looks at a system level interference issue. <laughs> okay, he likes it. <laughs> Who else likes it? <laughs> Does it sound better? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, some people like it, some people don't like it. So we have limited time budget. I think we have only, uh, let's say, four hours left in the course. Maybe if we push it four and a half hours. And I have three topics. This. This is relatively easy. Uh, and interconnect, interconnection networks and heterogeneous multi-core. So let's take a vote. Who wants this topic de to be definitely covered? Okay. Okay, people are increasing their hands. <laughs> who, who wants uh, interconnects to be covered? Oh, wow. Who wants heterogeneous multi-core to be covered? Oh, I cannot make a decision now. <laughs> it's almost equal, right? <laughs> I'm not going to do bean counting at this point. <laughs> I hate bean counting. There's, there's so many bean counters in the world. Yeah. Hmm? Flip a coin. Flip a coin. Okay. <laughs> I think people like this one. <laughs> what do you think? This is a mouse, right? <laughs> yeah, this is what? This is a mouse. It's a mouse? Oh. I see. That's right. That's right. This is a mouse. Yeah, exactly. Those are elephants. So let's cover the mouse. So we're going to use the principles that we've developed over here. Prioritize the mouse. <laughs> okay, so I like this because this is actually interesting. Uh, this is combining what we've discussed pa in the past with the interference. So how do you actually take advantage of a new DRAM substrate or a slightly modified DRAM to handle some of the big bottlenecks, in my opinion, uh, at, at the system level? And uh, the idea is actually... Uh, this. So if you look at the logical system organization that we have today, basically we're going to tackle the issue of interference between the CPU and the I.O. devices. If you look at uh, a system design today, you have the processor and then you have the I.O. devices and they communicate through the main memory system. I.O. access goes that way, CPU access goes that way, and these things clash with each other. They interfere. Main memory connects processor and I.O. devices and intermediate layer. So physical system implementation is something different. Basically, this is what happens. I.O. devices get connected through the processor or through the memory controller, to be more accurate, to the main memory. And CPU access is also this way. <coughs> As a result, you get high contention in the memory channel. Whenever you're doing an I.O. transfer, you're delaying CPU requests. And this also leads to high pin count in the processor as well because there needs to be connection through the I.O. devices to the memory controller. So the approach in this paper is going back to more like that 
uh, logical implementation. IO devices get connected to some other port in main, main, main memory with a main memory, of course, with a DRAM that actually enables that port. That's called dual data port. So you have an enabling uh, I.O. channel that's decoupled and isolated from the CPU channel. That's the idea, basically. At the high level, that's the idea, and we're done at this point, but we can go into a little bit more detail. Uh, as I already said the problem, and we wanted to design a new DRAM arch uh, architecture with two independent data ports with little cost. We call it the dual data port DRAM. You connect one port to the CPU and the other port to the I.O. devices. This way you can decouple CPU and I.O. accesses from each other. And there are many applications to this. Some of uh, these are evaluated, but there's a lot more to be done. For example, you can communicate between CPU and GPU. You have CPU and GPU on the two different sides of the memory. That way they don't need to interfere through the same channel, but they <coughs> communicate through, this, uh, through memory. You can do in-memory communication. You can block in-memory copy and initialization again through uh, this channel. And memory and storage communication, page fault, I.O. prefetching. So it can enable a lot. And we see actually significant performance improvements. You get 20% improvement in two channel, two rank system. And actually, this reduces the CPU pin count because the I.O. device don't, doesn't need to go through the CPU anymore. So let's go through this relatively quickly. The problem in a little bit more detail, this is what happens basically. You have this I.O. interface that gets connected to the I.O. devices and I.O. Uh, interface interacts with the uh, memory control through the direct memory access engine. And if you want to access main memory, let's say you want to put a page from storage into main memory, you have to go through the CPU. Yeah, this is again a processor-centric mindset, right? Not the storage, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. I agree, but data, data still needs to move some, from some place to another, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, extra pins, that's right, that's right. There, there may be no extra pins today right, in the current system. I agree with that, yes. But still, there is interference. The interference still exists, right? Okay. Okay, basically, you get significant memory channel contention over here because a CPU is also trying to access uh, main memory at the same time. And this is some, uh, you, can, you can read the paper for more detail. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the graphs in this uh, since we don't have a lot of time. But basically, this is the fraction of execution time, and this is the time spent on CPU-GPU communication across different workloads. And a large fraction of the execution time is spent on I.O. accesses for these uh, uh, workloads, basically, GPU workloads. Okay, there's a high cost for the I.O. interface also, but you can take a look at it uh, as well in the paper. Uh, okay, so what's the idea? Uh, basically, the approach is this. We want to move these over here, and memory uh, controller CPU accesses uh, over here, and we have this other I.O. interface that goes through the DRAM. And there's some control channel that needs to happen between memory controller and the I.O. interface over here. And you control this. Uh, basically, you need to have some handshake between this interface and this interface so that you can control uh, the dual data port DRAM. Yes, but we're going to try to reduce the cost of that also. Yeah. So we have CPU access and you can have IO access. Uh -huh. Forget about DNA. Just give it a CPU, you probably get, you know, 80% uh, performance gain. Yeah. 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 You get performance You get significant performance gain, but you need to satisfy these also, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, you need to satisfy these. That's the difficulty. That's why it's good to have this. So that's the idea. This is called decoupled. So how do you design this dual data port DRAM? Uh, basically, you have the control channel and then you have the data channel. This is DRAM operation that we've seen before. But if you look internally, you have a data port and you have a control port into the DRAM. And the control port sends the activate, the bank becomes ready, and then you send a read command, and then through the data port you get the data back. I mean, this is what we've seen before put in a different way, as you can see. So DRAM peripheral logic controls the banks and transfers data over the memory channel. Now, if there's another bank over here, uh, oh, something is happening here. Wait a second. Okay, you do the read, and you read from this other bank, and you go through the same data port, right? So I have many banks and a single data port. And requests are served serially due to the single data port, and we motivated it, obviously, ping counts, right? Uh, 
So the problem is really single data port in this case. If you, uh, that's li really limiting our bottleneck. But if you had two data ports, which is an obvious idea, you could do something like this, right? You could overlap the latents. And that's the idea, basically. We just want to add another data port over here, keeping the control port the same. Control overheads is actually a lot. We don't want to increase that. But we ha want to have two data ports. So basically, you have MUXs connecting uh, the banks to different data ports. And you have a port select signal. And the area overhead is this much. Of course, this increases the cost of the DRAM now. It's maybe 20, 20 more pins, and the area overhead is this much. Right? So now you, have, you get twice the data bandwidth and independent data port with low overhead. Control bandwidth is usually not a problem into DRAM, so we're not changing the control port. So this is the memory system, basically. You have the CPU channel connected there, you have the I.O. channel connected there, and you have the control channel with port, port select over there. So there are three different data transfer modes. You access through the TPU channel. This is DRAM read or write with CPU port selection. That should be obvious, hopefully. I.O. access, access through the I.O. channel. You do a DRAM read and write with I.O. port selection. And actually, you can do port bypass also, which means that you can directly transfer between the channels, DRAM access with port bypass selection. Let's take a look at these modes very quickly again. Hopefully, this is relatively obvious by now. You basically, if you want to access through the CPU, you, uh, can, you basically send a command saying you want to access through there, and you connect the bank to the CPU channel, you do the read, and the data gets delivered that way. If you want to do the IO access mode, it's exactly the opposite, basically. It's also ob obvious. And you can read from the same bank, as you can see, right? You can connect any bank to any data port. And port bypass mode is this, basically. This way, you can actually, for example, go through the DRAM chip and go into the uh, uh, processor chip, which is also not a bad functionality to have. OK, so what are the applications for this? Basically, we looked at three different things. Communication between compute units, CPU, GPU communication, in-memory communication and initialization, bulk page copy and initialization, and communication between memory and storage, storing page faults uh, and file read and write. Let's see, very, we'll, we'll go through this very quickly again. So let's say you want to do compute unit to compute unit communication. This is what we're going to do. This is a CPU, this is a GPU, uh, and this is your source, and this is your destination. That's how you designate. You basically, uh, you basically read with I.O. select through, through your memory. And uh, in, the, in the DDMA controller, you say CPU to GPU communication, such that you enable this communication. And that acknowledges it. And once you get the acknowledgment, so there needs to be a protocol so that you can communicate from the CPU and GPU. So they communicate through this DDMA I.O. interface. And when you send the signal saying that CPU wants to communicate with the GPU, you get an acknowledgment over here, and you set up uh, the destination over here, and you can write with I.O. channel selected into the memory, con memory controller of the GPU. Basically, you transfer data through this DDMA without interfering with GPU and CPU memory access. CPU can be doing stuff over here. GPU can be doing stuff over here. But also, in the background, or concurrently, you're moving some data from this memory to this memory, right? Because both of them have these dual data port memory, which makes sense, I think, right? <laughs> OK, so in-memory communication, this is an easier one, maybe. Basically, you, ha you can have a destination and a source in this DRAM. You set one to read mode, and you set the other one to write mode. And that's exactly how you do. You do this copy. You offload this copy, basically, to this interface over here. You don't disturb the CPU. So because you have this other data port, CPU can do accesses over here. Here, we're doing page copy in the background. Say it again? Yeah, you can think of it that way, exactly. Yeah. But you're not using the channel that the CPU is using because you have extra data for it. So hopefully, it's, it's not as good as row clone, clearly. You're not doing it inside the memory chip. But it's better than what we do today. OK, that's the idea. And memory storage, hopefully, it should be obvious by now, basically, if you want to transfer something from storage into uh, the memory, which is the destination over here. You basically say, I, we want to access storage. And you, com uh, you connect the storage to the other channel. And there's some acknowledgment mechanism. And the storage directly writes into the destination after the things are set up. And the CPU can keep doing accesses uh, to memory at that time. So basically, you're utilizing an, a, a different data port. So we evaluate this with. Uh, multiple applications, as we discussed. And these are the performance improvements you get. 
CPU, GPU, communication intensive workloads, you get significant performance benefit depending on how many cores you have. Uh, and you get more performance improvements at higher core, core count. And this is for the in-memory communication data copy, basically. Uh, basically, you're offloading the data copy to this other port. And here, you're offloading the communication to the other port. And in the storage uh, transfer, you're offloading the storage data copy to the other port also. And there is more evaluation in the system, basically, with channel count, performance improvement. Reduces, of course, right? Because you need more channels to tolerate some of these issues. Uh, and with rank count, performance improvement increases, but you can take a look because rank switching penalty actually becomes very important over here. Okay. Yeah, basically with one channel, you can get the almost uh, half of halfway between uh, with one channel. Uh, okay. I don't know what the, what this is basically. Okay, you can we can read the paper for that one. I don't remember what this one depicts because I don't understand this graph here at this point. That's okay. Okay, so that's the idea. I think I've covered it much faster than I thought. Any questions? So I think I like this because it really combines the multiple concepts. You, you, we talk about DRAM design, and we talk about interference. You can actually put, to, put these things together. Yes? Mm, what, what, uh, so yeah, in this case, you need to handle through the software. Yes, exactly. Basically, you need to ensure that uh, th that those caches, the, th the things that you're changing, are not in the caches. I think there is also some other discussion that we can have in terms of whose responsibility should be uh, to handle those things. Uh, I know there's a lot of direct cache access mechanisms, for example, that are also employed in existing systems. So maybe that part of the architecture needs some more that rethinking. Yes. That's right. I mean, you could do that also. We didn't. That's a, that's another ap application of this, but we didn't evaluate that. I think yes, basically, <laughs> you get higher bandwidth also. Yeah, yeah. I think that also improves your performance even, even if you're not doing this sort of communication, right? Yeah. yeah, I think once you have a dual data port DRAM, uh, maybe you, have, you design a flexible architecture such that that port is used for multiple different purposes, but then you will have the interference again. Yeah, you should have a port, <laughs> uh, a port which, which is underutilized. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Any other questions? Yes. That is true, but uh, uh, in this case, uh, you, we want to also reduce the interference, right? You would still have an interference on that bus. I agree. Uh, but but this, the, the dual data port, uh, what, what it enables is uh, you reduce the interference. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. So this is the end, basically. <laughs> For, for memory interference and QoS. There, there are more backup slides, but I'll leave uh, those with you. Now this is the real decision time. <laughs> because whatever we start uh, may really uh, interfere with the other thing. 